Good morning. Nice to have you all, all you folks here. And uh, it is, it is a, a, a resuming, let's put it that way. Okay, so we are glad that uh, we have uh, uh, made a time to come and fellowship with one another. We need this. Amen. And uh, folks that are watching and uh, those that are uh, staying home for obvious reasons, you are still part of our church. And we want you to know that the blessings of the Lord will be upon you as we all together listen to his voice. Es un placer para mí estar, dar la bienvenida a la audiencia internacional y ustedes saben quiénes son y estamos contentos de que nos están, uh, se están uniendo a esta, uh, este servicio que vamos a empezar eh, de, de aquí a poco. El tema que vamos a, a estudiar se llama Dios está en control. Y el texto principal es Isaías 59.1. 59.1 We will, I want you to consider this text. From Neil read it beautifully and I want uh, I want to use this um, this uh, version here Isaiah 59 1 says behold the Lord's hand is not what shortened at all that it cannot save nor his ear dull with what deafness that it cannot hear there are two great principles, two great truths as we see this text. One is that the hand of the Lord is not what? Is not shortened. That implies that the hand of the Lord is what? Is extended and his hand open. The other principle is that there's nothing wrong with the Lord's ear. I like this slide. His ear is not out of order. Do you believe that? Yes. And when you and I have experienced his blessing, that he hears our prayers, then, then, our spiritual walk takes a different path. When we talk to the Lord, you can take it to the bank that there is a listening ear up there. And it doesn't matter the time of the day, the time of the night, God is bending his ear individually. That is the beauty. You know, salvation is an individual issue. We are not saved by a bunch. We are not saved by a clan, by a club. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God for that. So, the text challenges us to keep on talking to the Lord because God is listening. He is listening keenly to our cries, to our petitions. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter in what quarter of the world we find ourselves. It doesn't matter whether I have this type of degree or pedigree. It doesn't matter the culture that I'm coming from or the language that I speak. We know, we know that God hears us all when we come to him. There are the most common, I would say, audible prayers, like the one we just uttered, for the benefit of the whole congregation. What other ways do we talk to the Lord? 
there are those that it's only you and him. You can be driving your, your spouse next to you and you do not know what your spouse is doing or what your child is doing. They may be communicating, communicating silently and God hears them all. In other instances, the pain, the anguish, the stress is so much that there's no effort, there's no strength to even utter. You have to groan and moan, and God hears them all. He understands. This might be news to you, maybe not, I hope not, but if you shed tears before the Lord, that is a form of prayer. Did you know that? A tear. And it's beautifully put together by King David in Psalm 58. That God collects our tears in his body and then writes them down in his book. How many books are, are there in heaven? Three? Which one? Let's have this dynamic interaction. There is the book of life, right? There is the book of remembrance. And there's the other book that you and I don't want our names to be there. Because he says that in the judgment day, the books, what? Will open. But God takes those tears of yours and mine and puts them in his bottle and then juts them down. Why are you crying? Back in the uh, late 60s or so, uh, Max Mays, who happened to that yeah, he died not too long ago, uh, he put together the Heritage Singers. And back at, this song goes back to, to the 70s, if I am not wrong. Beautiful song, beautiful song. And the lyrics say that you often wonder why tears come to your eyes. But the highlight in yellow says what? Tears are a language that God understands. Many a times, and I have been there, probably you have, we get so desperate. We're praying over things. And then we want answers like this. And we forget who we're talking to. Who we're praying to. God says, my thoughts are not what? Your thoughts. Your thoughts. And my ways are not what? Yeah. Your ways. That's why when he taught us, the disciples, and comes down to us, how to pray, he said, thy, you should say this, thy will be what? Yeah. Thy will be done. But a lot of times we get so desperate and we want answers and then we say, hey, God doesn't answer us. He doesn't answer me. He never did. But is that true? Is that true? I found this uh, pretty interesting by President Jimmy Carter. God always answers prayer, sometimes with a yes, sometimes with a no, and sometimes with a, you've got to be kidding. I thought that was cute. You know, um, you know the, the tradition that God says yes, sometimes he says no, and then sometimes says, hey, hang on, hang on. But when we are in tune in his will, in his plan, God is ready to answer our prayers in his own perfect time and in his own perfect 
way. The classic, the classic thing that comes to mind, and I'm bringing it up to you folks, is the Apostle's Paul, Paul's experience. You know, the Apostle Paul, a scholar, highly intelligent. We all know how he came to the Lord. You remember how he did? Road to the map. On the road to Damascus. And then, and then, he became the ambassador, the mouthpiece to the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. That's why you and I are here. Amen. Amen. And furthermore, he wrote half of the New Testament yeah. in chains. Yeah. But he came with an experience. He describes it in 2 Corinthians uh, 12. He says, a thorn in my flesh. And he came to the Lord three times. He prayed earnestly three times, Lord, take away this problem. In fact, he adds, he says, this is a messenger of Satan to slap me all over. Did that thorn get taken away? So, did God forget to answer his beloved servant? His maximum exponent of the word at that time? No. No. The answer and sometimes we label this wrongly, Paul's unanswered prayer. But no, God answered his prayer, but not in the way that Paul wanted. He wanted out because it was just a thorn. How many have had a little thorn? A little thing hurts, yeah. right? Yeah. I have to dig and dig until I get it out, and even if I bleed. Now imagine, but God answered his servant this way. My grace, no Paul, I will not take that away from you. But here's my answer. My grace is sufficient for you. And Paul endured until his offering. He dealt with it. But now he's not alone because he has what? The assurance that God's grace is sufficient to carry him through. A lot of times we have the tendency uh, as, as, as a child sometimes, you know, I remember that I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old or so, and I wanted to be a driver. I wanted to drive. In fact, one day my my brother, who is a year and a half younger, he was around five or so, and he got in in the car, and there was a little there was a slope, and at the end of the street, the huge stadium, soccer stadium, and he is pretended to be driving, and he pulled the thing down, and the car started to go. When he saw that it was moving, he had sense enough to jump out. <laughs> and the, this is 1965 in southern Guatemala. And then he goes down, the car goes down, goes down, and it came to a halt when it hit the sidewalk. Boy, my dad was running after that car. Thank God no, no vehicle came by. But for him and for me, when we wanted to become drivers, the timing was not quite right. Why? We were too little, too short. Our minds have not developed. There was something had to happen for us to grow. There had to be training along the way. And then what? At the proper age, we had to have a permit issued by the government, just like we do here, right? 
15 years old or so, they're eager to get their, uh, what you call that? Um, Royal Thunder. Yes, yes, yes. And folks, let me tell you that we are not any different when it comes to our relationship with our maker. We're just like kids. It doesn't matter how many years we have on this earth, how many hairs we have on our head, it doesn't matter. We behave just like little children. But the Lord says no when he doesn't answer the way we want to. He says no, just slow it down. You have to have some structure. You have to have some backbone. You have to have mental growth, emotional growth, physical growth, and above all, spiritual growth. In fact, you all know about Oswald Chambers. You remember him who wrote his utmost, his, what is it called? His highest? My highest, yes, that one. Yes, yes. And he said, our Lord never referred to an answered prayer. He taught that prayers are always answered. Everyone who asks, receives. And he implied that prayers are answered rightly because of the Heavenly Father's wisdom. That's the key. Your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. That is a blessing. That's why the testimony of Brother uh, uh, Carey, that's beautiful. He has more stars than petitions as he had because the Lord has come through. That's one of the principles of the memory verse that we study. The hand of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot say. His ear is not what? Deaf that he cannot hear. So we, we already discussed the first principle. Now I want to arrest your attention to the first principle of the verse. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot say. What does this mean? Isaiah 9.21 says, His hand is stretched out still. For what? To repair our lives, our broken pieces. Right. To rescue. How many times have we had a Peter's experience? Dire situation. How the Lord came through. I have conveyed and I will refer as long as I'm here because this is something worthy to be praised. That I am here with you standing right here because the Lord came through to my rescue when I was down in South America. Amen. Amen. He made it possible out of nothing. When I wanted to fly back. Oh, I tell you, God is real. He answers prayers in spite of. Amen. His hand is stretched out still to rebuild, to restore. It doesn't matter how your pieces have crumbled down. If you come to the Lord and believe that he is, he will put back everything together and give you much more. He, his hand is stretched out to restore, to reconstitute. Reconstitute is a word that we use a lot in, 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 in healthcare terms. You have a vial, you have to add this certain liquid to shake it up. Now, the medication is effective. Before, it wasn't. You can use it. But once it's reconstituted, now it's effective. The hand of the Lord is stretched out to save. And that is the main thing that God specializes in saving Folks like you and saving folks like me. Amen. In fact, in fact, his job is to bring us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And I think that each one of us here, at some point, we have been in darkness. 
And because his hand stretched out, has pulled us from that situation and brought us to broader, brighter light. Amen. Amen. What is Isaiah, God saying through this servant Isaiah, that he is in control, folks. But it's been about two months or so that I quit watching news. Yeah. Quit watching news. Amen. Disappointed. Disenfranchised. Because nobody knows what they're talking about. Right. With all the respect to the scientists and so forth. But they do not know. Last week I said in, in my sermon is that no one knows what lies behind beyond the bend. Nobody knows. And it's fascinating to me that as days go on, there's new tweaking. There's new tweaking. Uncharted territory. But God is in control, folks, of the destiny of this world. We have said it before. We have said it. That this pandemic didn't take God by surprise. It took us all by surprise. Yeah. But not God. When we look at, at, at his word to us, and we look at Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, and you ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to lighten up your mind, you will see how God is in control at every step of the way. Who tells you that he is not in control now? The Bible says that Psalms 33 9 says that he spoke and it was done. He commanded and stood fast. You know, that's how he created this world. But when it came to you and to me, he used his hands. He fashioned us. He fashioned us. Folks, we have a dynamic God. Amen. First, uh, chapter 1 in John says that the word becomes what? Flesh. Flesh. You know the word, word. In Spanish, it says the verb became flesh. It changes. It changes. And it enriches you when you know a little bit more than one language. It says the verb, verb is what? Action. Right? Dynamic. God is working on our behalf. Your salvation and my salvation. Now, his hand is not is stretched out. For what? To save us. To save us. But we have issues in this world. Don't we? We're living through it. Amen. And here's where Revelation 7.1 ties in to Isaiah 59.1 says, after this, I saw how many angels? Four. Standing. Standing. That is very important. At the corner of the earth, restraining, holding back the four wings of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or the sea or the tree. God has put four angels. Did you know that? Four angels in the four quarters of the north, south, east, and west. They are there for a reason. Now, angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's the reason why. God has them there because he wants to save you and he wants to save me. Yeah. And they are standing. They're standing. And this is very important because the, the Bible uses the word standing. That means that their job is what? Is solemn. It is important. It is an awesome job. It is a, it is a sense of urg urgency that something is about to happen. They're standing us into battle. And, and, we are here in Irvine. 
And this gospel is to be preached through the four corners of the world. But we don't have to worry about Asia, Africa, South America, Central America. We ought to focus where? Mm -hmm. Here in Irma, because there are folks that still need to hear the good news that God saves and that he is coming back very, very soon. The Lord of heavenly forces has created a plan. What plan is that? What plan? Come on. What plan? Salvation. The plan of salvation. Who can stop it? God's hand is extended. Who will stop it? There is nothing that will, that will hindrance God's plan. Nothing. God is in control, folks. Because he is looking after you. He is protecting us. He is providing for us. And the main reason that you and I are still here is because of what? The Lord's mercies. Amen. Because of the Lord's, Lord's mercies, we are not what? Destroying. You know, it is said that, um, that it would be an awesome experience when everything is said and done. To talk to your guardian angel, and he will let you know from how many perils you were saved. I was saved. I know for a fact that I was saved, tangibly, and that was my guardian angel in the form of a little black boy. It is because his love, his compassion, that we fail not. The plan of salvation, folks. That's why he has his hand stretched out, guarding those winds of strife, not to blow on us. Because the adversary is eager to destroy us. Do you believe that? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Huh? Folks, the devil is walking just like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour and why? Because he knows that he has a short, short, short time. How come he knows it that he has no chance to salvation? How come? Sometimes we just don't, and I'm I'm speaking in general terms. It seems like we don't. But hear this message today. Why is God restraining the winds of earth? Number one is because he is love. Mm -hmm. Because he is mercy. Because he is kind. He is long-suffering. Because of grace. Because he is a savior like Elder C.D. Brooks used to say. He is a savior. He's not a sheriff. And he wants all, all, who are willing to come to repentance. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but to come to repentance. What would happen if God withdraws his hand, his hand of protection over those wind, over the four corners of the world? What would happen? We would be destroyed. Game over. Game over. The world would come to a halt. And it will. And it will. But not in God, not in man's timing. You know, there are folks in great power that they have the ability to press a button, so call, and destroy this world. But we have been told that that will not happen, folks. That will not happen. Because God is in control. Amen. Daniel 2 chapter 7. Chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 21. God set, set, up, set up kings and he demotes them. And sometimes you and I may get out of shape as we see how the politics of the nation is going back and forth. Folks, that should not be our concern anymore. God is in control. He has everything timed out. A 
angels are now restraining the winds of strife until the world shall be warned of its coming doom. But a storm is gathering, ready to burst upon the earth. And when God shall bid his angels lose the winds, there will be such a scene of strife as nothing can preach. This is serious business, folks. This is not scare tactics either. Don't get scared. If you and I are under his wings, we have nothing to fear. If we have made him our refuge and strength, he is a very pleasant help in trouble. Amen. Now, coming down, he is giving us a message today, folks. And he says, I will hold back the winds if you mend things with me. And the invitation is right there, standing all along. Come and let us reason together. Bring your case towards me, to, to me, and let's discuss where, where things are going wrong in your life. I will hold back the winds if you help me save more people from your household, from your neighbors, from your workplace, from your community. I will hold back the winds. I will continue to if you engage without reservation in my church. I will hold back the winds. If you come to know me for yourself, not just hearsay, because knowing about Jesus will not save us. Knowing him is what will save us. I will hold back. I will hold back the winds. If you take that final step to turn over your life and join the group of believers that are holding the truth up in spite of, the prophet Joel says that there are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And the day of the Lord is near. And we'll find many in the valley of decision. Non-committal. There's a fear of committing to. Folks, the Lord is holding back the winds so that you and I We'll stop playing with our salvation. You know, our life is on the line. And the Lord is pleading with us today. I will hold back those winds of scribes. Hebrews 10, I will summarize it for you here. He says that if we continue after we have been enlightened, after the Lord has, with his stretched out hands, has brought us from the Darkness into his marvelous light. And we continue to be stoned. That's what uh, I'm paraphrasing it. If we sin uh, uh, willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. Back in the times of Moses, it said that someone would die on the testimony of two or three. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of God? Serious business, folks. Almost all this week, this, this text has been, have been preaching to me. But make sure that I am not caught off guard Playing, playing with my salvation. There is a sanctuary in heaven. And the Lord is interceding for you and for me right now. Right now. You can come to him right now. You can just utter a silent prayer. And he will hear you. He will take your case. He will take my, pray, my, my case. But there is a time very, very soon that is coming that... The words that he pronounced while he was on the cross will are echoing down the time of history and it will be it is finished. No more time. The time of grace 
have entered. And then the fearful words will be pronounced. He who is unjust, what happens? Continue to be. He who is filthy, continue to be filthy. But he who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Like I said, this is not a, 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 a fear a tactic, something to spook you. Let the Holy Spirit do that. And evaluate ourselves in God's presence. If we are fully following him, that if by any, heaven forbid, we would not see the light tomorrow, that we are secured in under his pavilion, under his wings. We have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. God has made every provision for you and for me not to be lost. So, folks, our challenge is to get right with God before it's too late. Amen. And get others ready Amen. before it's too late. Because the signs of the times are saying that we are much, much closer than what we think. You see that little thing on the mirror right on the right side? Don't trust the mirror on the right, right? Because things are closer than what you think. Folks, the Lord is coming. Let's prepare ourselves. Let's dedicate. Let's make that final decision to embrace him wholeheartedly. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand up and, uh, and uh, sing our last uh, song. Only two stanzas, the first and the last, if you're using your hymnals. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, all gratefully sing his wonderful love. Oh, yes. <laughs> 